And uh, before I introduce Rosanna officially, I have a question for Rosanna. Where is she at there? Okay. Uh, Rosanna, I have a question. Uh, you know there's a brand new dinosaur they have found that, that it was blind? I didn't hear about that, Jerry. And the name is going to be called, Do You Think He Saw Us? And before I introduce Roseanne, I wanna I want to also acknowledge that uh, in our room tonight is Dr. Jennifer Pomeroy. She's a GIS professor at uh, at York College York College of Pennsylvania, I guess it's still a, that's what it's called. And uh, she's in the geography department, teaches GIS. And she did invite her summer students to join in tonight. I don't know if any of those are here or not. We do have 45 people, so uh, you may have a couple of, not yet, it's okay. Thank you, Jennifer. She just, she just uh, chatted me and said, nobody yet, so. But we are, welcome her in. Uh, I do some, uh, I do a lecture and two field trips for her every semester. Uh, and we have fun with the GIS students going to uh, Chickie's Rock, I think, in Lancaster County yet. So uh, anyway, Dr. Pomeroy, thanks for joining us. You're, you're again another, uh, you're a Pennsylvanian, but you're not in the New York area either. So um, thanks for everything that you do and hang in there. The summer's soon to be over. <laughs> All right, so our program tonight is uh, Sinkholes in Pennsylvania. And the, the uh, long timers that have been with us for the last 57 versions of our Zoom rock room. I uh, might remember Rosanna from last year. She did a program about caves over in the Allentown uh, area. And uh, Rosanna did graduate from Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. And she, uh, I actually got to meet her and had the privilege to work with her with at the York County Parks, uh, we worked together. And then she sadly left the York County Parks and went to her current job with the, I still call it the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey in Harrisburg. Uh, and now she's in, under the uh, Geological Mapping Groundwater Environmental Geology Division as a geoscientist. And uh, I mentioned Rosanna with Marianne Furness. We've We've uh, worked together on several projects and wrote a couple of things together, like the uh, rail trail geology of New York County rail trail. And uh, she's a dear friend. Every time I see her, I have to take her peanut butter cups and I owe her more after tonight's program. So uh, I'll just load the truck up and just drop it in her driveway. So Rosanna, thanks for doing this program. It's all yours and welcome aboard. Great, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it says here the host has disabled screen sharing. What happened there? Did that work? Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining in tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about sinkholes in Pennsylvania, and I do work for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources at the Bureau of Geological Survey. And as the CARS specialist at the survey, it's my job to answer people's questions uh, when they think they have a sinkhole problem. So sinkholes, uh, what is a sinkhole and what is not a sinkhole? Then the two, uh, they'll really look the same from the surface, but the root cause is different. And we need to know which is which to tailor the solution to the problem. Uh, so a safer term is subsidence, which just means the, the land settling down in. And Pennsylvania does have a long history of dealing with subsidence, uh, both from mining, from sinkholes, um, and then from other sort of man-made features. 
Uh, one of our very famous ones is uh, the Corporate Plaza, which was built in Allentown in 1986. And in 1994, there were some ice storms, some heavy snow, a lot of rain and runoff. And suddenly a, a hole opened up that was 40 feet wide by 50 feet long and 15 feet deep. And unfortunately, the supports for the building were, uh, were also settled in that event, and they had to condemn the building and, and tear it down. Here's an example from Lehigh County, and you can see that it took out you know, sort of the entire lane in this residential neighborhood. And as Jerry used for his, uh, his background there, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Hershey at the Tanger Outlets uh, in 2018. And if you remember, 2018 was a super rainy year where we got 68 inches of rain as opposed to our normal 42 in a year. And, and the parking lot uh, kind of dropped down in. Uh, here's another example. I'm not sure uh, exactly where it is, but a similar situation. Uh, I suspect they first tried to repair it with the gravel and, and you have this sort of omnipresent snow fence, which warns you that there's a sinkhole lurking around. Um, and unfortunately, this parking lot fell in also. Hold on. My computer wants to restart. That is not good. Nine minutes. Um, well, I'll talk fast and then log back in. I don't know what else to do. I can't let it snooze. Um, so not all uh, sinkholes are a problem. You know, farmers have been dealing with them for a long time. They just plow around it and they throw their field stones down in there. We have many just in the woods in Pennsylvania and they're there and they just do their own thing. Um, and not all sinkholes are a problem. Uh, some of them here, you know, and they're an important part of the hydrologic network. In this case, there's a stream that is flowing down into the sinkhole and going underground. Well, that water can go underground and uh, come up elsewhere as a spring. So there's, there's several sources of land subsidence. Um, one, it can be a sinkhole, which forms in dissolvable rocks. Uh, one can be a man-made feature, um, such as cultural relics, infrastructure failure. We see this a lot with leaking water lines. Um, or mine subsidence is another one we face in Pennsylvania. Well, sinkholes in the classic sense are found in carbonate rocks like limestone, dolostone, marble. Uh, these are dissolvable rocks on a very long time scale. We're talking about millimeters in a thousand years. Um, often there are circular depressions with underground drainage. Uh, we have caves under the area. And the term karst that you hear me use a lot, um, it's just the type of topography over an area that is underlain by these dissolvable rocks. And we might have, uh, you know, the sinkholes, these closed depressions, disappearing streams and springs, down here springs, or, or a whole cave network. Uh, in Pennsylvania, this is our distribution map of where we have limestone and dolostone and also marble in the state. And the eastern two thirds of the state there, what's in the, the sort of brighter blue, they're the ones that tend to have more significant problems with the sinkholes. Well, here's some, some basic chemistry. What we have is carbon dioxide in both the atmosphere and the soil, and it mixes with rainwater to form a weak carbonic acid. Um, this is the same thing as seltzer water. So not a strong acid at all. But you can imagine this slightly acidic water 
which has picked up some carbon dioxide from the air and from the soil, is now working its way down into these bedrock fractures. And it's expanding them a little bit at a time, that millimeter in 10,000 years. On this outcrop, you, you can see this etched appearance. It almost looks like somebody was uh, sharpening a knife, um, but that's just that slow dissolution over time. Now, as the dissolution takes place, going down the fractures, you can form bigger cavities. And some of these have become our beautiful Pennsylvania caves. So how do you know what your bedrock geology is? So in order to look at, um, you know, pick your spot and see what lies beneath, we have a program called PA Geode. And you can just Google PA Geode. Um, and if you remember, geodes are the sort of boring looking lumpy rocks. And when you crack them open, there's beautiful crystals inside. And we have this database that hopefully shows you something beautiful inside. You can uh, search for your location and under the bedrock geology layer, look for your lithology, which is your rock type, and then look for limestone, marble, or dolostone. Um, you can also use this application to look for areas that maybe um, had mining. There's also a layer for karst features. Um, it's not complete, and we haven't updated it recently, but it's a starting point. And, and karst is that landscape over the limestone, dolostone, and marble. And in this case, the orange dots are closed depressions, and green are actually open sinkholes. So if you're in an area where you are seeing a bunch of those, then you want to pay more attention than an area that doesn't have any mapped. We have a, a handy pamphlet, which you can search for and download and print out, uh, called Sinkholes in Pennsylvania, if you're really interested in the topic. So one of the things we like to do is look at the historical air photos, because you know, as humans, we keep changing the surface of the earth, but pictures we have from the past can give us a hint of what's going on. Now at this intersection, um, the 1958 photo is during the growing season. It doesn't help us at all, except note this little pond here. It's a little closed depression, so the water's draining down under into the limestone. And that 1964 photo, probably taken in the spring, you can see some, some wet spots that have sort of a drainage pattern, but then these patchy spots that don't drain out. If we uh, zoom forward to 2006, they have put a housing development on top of that one over there. I would be very concerned if I lived in that spot. And you can see a couple closed depressions out in the farm field. And, and if things go as they usually do, there will probably be a housing development there before too long. Um, and one of the big problems is that with more development, you get more rain runoff. And it's that changing the infiltration rate that really triggers a bunch of our sinkholes. You can also look at your uh, topographic maps and look for the contours with the little tick marks on them. This is up by Pleasant Gap in Center County. And during Hurricane Agnes, it rained so hard that these 64 acres of land filled up with water, just formed a pond. People rode their motorboats around on it. Uh, if you go out there now, it kind of just looks like a farm field, some holding areas. But then there's also these smaller closed depressions with the tick marks. So you can look on the old maps and that might uh, clue you in. All right, I'm gonna uh, take a quick break. I'm gonna restart and I will come back, okay? All right, I'll tell you Sorry. Something <laughs> we actually, uh, we actually had a we case in your account. Uh, go ahead, Rosanna. Oh, yep, I, I, I thought I could cancel it, but it says no. So I'll be back.
we actually we actually had a we we actually have a case in your county where uh, we have a large uh, shopping mall called the uh, West Manchester Mall, and uh, before the mall was built over limestone, the field looked like a war field. Sinkhole after sinkhole, there were some caves uh, adjoining the sinkholes, and uh, it was just it was just nasty. And the mall people, the developer bought the land to build a mall. He brought the engineers in. They drilled to test the uh, strength of the bedrock. And they told it. They went back and told the developer, "We recommend you don't build a, a building this size here because the rock will not hold it." And after paying all that money for the engineers to do that work, you know what the developer said? We have to. It's a prime location. So they built them all. And uh, recently, in the last uh, three or four years, they actually uh, converted it from an indoor mall to the old time shopping center uh, appearance where you enter the store from the outside. But before they did that, uh, we had a Bonton uh, store in, uh, in the mall. And uh, I know of at least twice where, the, where their floor sunk. Um, you know, the one was in the dressing room, and uh, so I was waiting for for the bond time to have a basement sale one day. Uh, that didn't happen, but uh, when they redid the mall into the old shopping center appearance, uh, they did considerable work on uh, the sinkhole development out in the parking lot, and actually uh, between the parking lot and Route 30. Which goes for like right right past the uh, West Manchester Mall, and Route 30 itself had some issues taking place because of sinkholes under the roadway. They still do. So in this case, uh, the West Manchester Mall uh, has survived this uh, this little phase of its life. There's no. Uh, another, uh, till, till Rosanna gets back, uh, in one of our county parks here in York, uh, we have what we have a park that has limestone, but in the in the back part of the park is a sandstone ridge. And back in the 1980s, I forget exactly what year, it was a horseback rider riding through the park, and the horse stepped into what appeared to be a groundhog hole up on the ridge in the sandstone. And just within seconds, the horse was in a hole eight feet deep. Uh, now, luckily the rider was okay. Actually, the horse was okay. Uh, happened on a Sunday. The uh, park maintenance people had to come out with the bulldozer and dig a ramp to get the horse out. But we determined that that was a case where uh, the limestone under the sandstone actually developed a subsurface sinkhole. And there's like a picture of a, a, a bridge of sandstone over the sinkhole. And when the horse went over the uh, bridge and fell into the sinkhole and, and the weight collapsed the bridge. Uh, so that was kind of a little bit of a different type of sinkhole. But uh, they are many, many places and can be devastating. With that, I think Roseanne is back with us. I am. Sorry about that, guys. It's always something around here. <laughs> um, so are you seeing the topo map? Yes. OK. So uh, talking about you know things to look for if you're uh, looking for sinkholes or looking to determine if it's underlain by a carbonate, like a limestone or a dola stone. The other thing we want you to do is to be observant. Um, this is in Hershey, PA, this past winter. And you can tell that this area of the road has been patched previously. So they fixed this sinkhole once before. And it opened up again. You can see all the material they had put in there originally. You know, that's, that's a little thicker than a normal roadbed. Um, but there was continued subsidence 
So uh, either they just patched it, they didn't really fix it, uh, or something significant was going on there. Another thing to look for are these uh, ghost lakes. And the, oftentimes there'll be the, the low feature where water will collect and it uh, can't drain. So after a heavy rain or, or snow melt, you'll have this pond. And this is in Snyder County and the farm, the crops went right through it. So I presume that the farmer didn't drive through the, the water and the tadpoles, but had actually sown the crop before the rain. Now, if we take a peek at the subsurface, this might help you kind of visualize what's going on. Um, this is in a quarry where they stripped off the topsoil because they're gonna mine the limestone. But look at how irregular that is. I mean, limestone's a sedimentary rock. It should be nice layers, but due to the dissolution, the water has picked pathways and eroded down and left behind the high spots. Now we call the, the high spots are called pinnacles and the low spots are called cutters. And if you knew that this was under your, um, your planned home or, or business or whatnot, you could anchor into solid bedrock and, and fill in those low spots, um, but plan ahead so that you don't have a sinkhole problem. So here's a road cut along 322 and the limestone beds are dipping to the left and you can see the cavities, but they're full of soil. And that's typically what we have in Pennsylvania. It took them a long time to form, and then most of them are clogged up with dirt. And if we were to walk along the top of this road cut, we may not notice anything. But from the side, you can picture what a problem is going to develop if, if that soil leaves that pipe or that cavity, and there's something up top besides a farm field. Now we have this fun cartoon in our limestone booklet and maybe it can help you kind of picture what's going on in the subsurface. The blue are the, the beds of limestone and the little pipes are all the fractures and joints that connect down into a, a bigger groundwater system. And the water's gonna work its way through the pipes um, and if they're full of soil and sand, it'll just work its way slowly but typically uh, something changes and it tips the balance. Um, it could be maybe more rainfall, it could be uh, maybe a housing development or something where there's water runoff, but it'll start to pull the soil down from below, creating an opening. And then once that opening is there, just like Jerry said, that bridge of sandstone that couldn't hold the horse, it could be a bridge of just more soil and it's gonna start to sink in. So there's, there's lots of different sort of types of sinkholes. Um, and in Pennsylvania, what we typically see is that lower left side, the buried sinkhole. The, it's all full of clay and gravel and sand and not much shows up at the surface. So moving on to sort of other ways that the land falls out from beneath our feet. Um, are these man-made things. They're, they're cultural relics, something left over from our farming past or um, you know, maybe an earlier development or infrastructure failure. We see this a lot along water and sewer lines. Uh, we see abandoned septic tanks or cisterns or, or hand-dug water wells um, that kind of you know, rear their ugly head later on. Um, building foundations, like if the the barn burned down, they just knocked the beams down in and ran the grader over it, pushed some dirt around, and now you have your new housing development site. Well, that material might start to, the beams will rot and fall down a little bit and cause a, a depression at the surface. Um, other things that rot, like wood, debris, and landfills. Um, and then some troubles along active stormwater drains and, and water lines that we don't want and the utility companies don't want, but they maybe don't get them fixed quick enough. And even things like the power line or the phone trench, 
you know, obviously the water's not flowing because of the power line and the phone trench. But when they dig those, they usually backfill it with a different material or it's not as compacted. And it could be a conduit or a barrier to flow. So here's an example. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pothole. Uh, but there might be a deeper problem going on. And you can see from this storm drain, you know, it's probably a parking lot designed to drain into that low spot and go down the storm sewer and, and off on its merry way. But something is causing the water on, on the orange cone side to skip going down the pipe and pick its own route. Um, and as it goes down there, it's gonna, you know, flush out the water. Here's an example from Harrisburg the bedrock they're sitting on is shale. It doesn't dissolve. It's not a real sinkhole, but it is a real problem there. Sometimes you can visually identify the problem within there. Like if they saw an old terracotta water main that had been abandoned, but maybe water's still flowing along. it. Uh, maybe you see a broken water main uh, currently, you know, the, the current water main. And that kind of gets into a which came first chicken and the egg, was the water line leaking, flushing out the material that caused the road to collapse, or did the road collapse for another reason and break the water main when it did? So this is one we see a lot at the geological survey. Um, people will get a tree cut down um, and, and stumped, they grind out the stump, and then time goes by and the root mass begins to decay. And you have to remember that the root mass of the tree is as big as the crown. So if you like, you know, look out in your yard and, you know, picture that tree, picture it upside down in there. So that's a lot of, of area that can rot and then sink. Um, one I had real recently, the lady had her swimming pool subsided just four inches in the deep end. Uh, which tore the pool liner, alerted her to the problem, and she wasn't in an area of limestone or of coal mining. Um, and when the pool repairman dug down, he found an old cesspool, which she'd lived there 30 years. She didn't know it was there, but the organics in there had rotted just enough for everything to sink just enough to tear the pool liner. In this example, uh, the water main along the road had been leaking and the water company knew it. And then the, the road collapsed in a small hole. And a few days later, the feeder line to this gentleman's house also collapsed. Um, and what it was is that water main when it was broken was flushing things out. And as it flushed things out, more and more things got pulled down in. So the final category we have in Pennsylvania is mine subsidence. Pennsylvania has a long history of mining, uh, famously known for coal, but also there are additional resources uh, such as lead, zinc, copper, uh, sand, mica, magnetite, slate, iron, uranium. Um, these mines tend to be small, but if it just happens to be inconveniently located under your property, you might find out that they were digging around there. This is a map of our coal mining regions in Pennsylvania with the anthracite in pink and the uh, bituminous coal in yellows and orange. And associated with the coal mining, there's a lot of, in addition to the mines, the infrastructure like the air shafts, the manways, the elevator shafts. Um, and a lot of times the coal companies um, kind of went out of business and skipped town and didn't repair them or they repaired them to the standards of a hundred and some years ago. And, and it just hasn't held up to the test of time. So here's a, a collapse in Scranton that was, it was called a sinkhole, but it is related to the coal mining. And if you picture, you know, the, the mine, as they're going through it, they're taking out some of the coal and leaving some of it, the rooms and the pillars. 
Well, over time, there's a lot of stress on those pillars and they can collapse. And when they collapse, the whole coal seam kind of sandwiches shut, but cracks propagate up to the surface and areas of the surface settle in. So here we have plenty of ways we could have a hole underground, and that's one of the key ingredients in here. So you need an opening or a void underground and a, police, a place for the material to go to, plus a way to move the material into that opening. Typically it's water, but also gravity um, can be the, the cause. So we wanna look at what's the trigger that it's kind of in balance and then something puts it out of balance. So if you take a look here at this photo in Lebanon County, um, this is a stormwater retention basin for a uh, small housing development. So all the downspouts and the gutters and the rain that can't, you know, soak into the streets is supposed to go in this basin and sit there and, you know, some ducks can hang out for a few days after the rain. And then it should slowly soak into the ground and dry up. But it turns out this area is underlain by limestone. And there are cavities that had been clogged with clay. And this low area, which the developer picked as the place to put the water retention basin, because it was already lower, was just like running a pressure washer. All that water flushed out the mud and clay that was keeping that surface flat. And now there's big holes in the ground. Uh, another similar example, it's a, a drainage swale coming in from the left. The water's supposed to go down that pipe. And instead, it found a quicker route straight down. Uh, which they tried to fix the first time with a bunch of boulders, figured they could let some of the water go down, but um, instead it's eating back more and more. What do you think uh, could be the trigger here? If you noticed the um, fire hydrant, you are correct. Um, there's not a lot of runoff in the area. There's a big solar farm on one side. The road on the other side has a pretty good curbing, so the road runoff isn't supposed to be coming through here. But a sinkhole formed. So if that um, fire hydrant line was leaking, it's been flushing out the material until the top just fell in. Um, so we have these, these cultural things, these man-made things, uh, where we have modified stormwater flow or put in utility lines and we have created the problem. Um, one we sometimes see is the groundwater extraction because as you're pumping water out you, know, you don't really think of water as holding up the land surface but it does provide some support. Um, you can think of it like a waterbed. If it's completely full and you get on top you stay up pretty high but if it's half full and you get on, you're, you're gonna sink down in. The example on the left is a very famous one from uh, San Joaquin Valley in California. And they, um, it's a cultural, agricultural area. So they were pumping the groundwater to irrigate the crops. And the land surface has literally sunk, the whole area has sunk down, what is that, maybe 20 feet in 20 years. And then there's a, a more modern example where the, the lady is showing the, the six foot of subsidence that's taken place due to groundwater pumping. So besides the cultural things, the things we do, there are environmental things that are triggering these sinkholes. Uh, we have short term and long term extreme weather events. Um, droughts, crazy wet years, um, and flooding. And this example is from 2018 of flooding in Pennsylvania. And you can just picture all that water just suddenly dumped in the system, needs somewhere to go. And, and in the foreground, you can see it actively eroding some of the, just the road bed material, 
but it's going to look for the quickest way and it's got a lot of power behind it. Um, there's some minor, um, well, another environmental thing you could get is a roof collapse. Like if there was actual cave underground and something triggered the roof to collapse, just gravity or, or a small earthquake, um, that'd be another example of an environmental trigger. Now, unfortunately, if you don't fix the sinkhole right, it will be back. So the first key is prevention, um, as best you're able. Use the resources when you're planning. Um, look at the geologic maps, look at the mining history, the soil maps, the topographic maps, and then cruise through those air photos, you know, to see what was at your site before you got there. Um, another thing to do is know your setting, know where your utility lines are. Uh, and you can call PA1 call and, and tell them you're going to be planting some shrubs and they'll come out and they'll spray paint your yard and you'll know where all your, your water lines, your cable, your phone, all those things go. And look at your place and try to figure out where does the water go? You know, so my front downspouts go down onto the driveway and off onto the street and the back downspouts go into a pipe in the ground. And I don't know where they go from there. Um, now, I'm not on a, a karst area, so I'm not too worried about it, but um, it's probably something I should figure out before it becomes a problem. Because the thing you want to make sure and do is manage your water. When it's coming from the downspouts or off your driveway, you know, where does it go? And keep alert for changes and, and get it away from the house. So in this unfortunate situation, uh, the area is underlain by limestone, but the trigger, I believe, was the downspouts. Um, you can see sort of the black plastic downspout extender laying in here, and maybe it came out to here before, um, or maybe it fell off. You know, sometimes we get those heavy rainstorms and they try to blow your downspouts apart. But it basically pressure washed a hole. His rhododendron fell in there, was never seen again. And so uh, we have we have our kind of a you know the bad, the good, and the better. And this would apply not only to a car setting, but anywhere. It's good to get the water away from the foundation of your house. It'll keep you from getting a wet basement. And also when it rains a lot in that bad situation. You're actually building up hydrostatic pressure. There's water pressure on the outside of your wall, and it could encourage your basement to collapse. But if you put a, a downspout extender on, get it a little further out. It's, it's a pain. You got to move it when you want to mow the lawn, but, but get that water away. Or even better, set up something that gets it away and gives it a place to soak in that doesn't involve your foundation. So back to that guy sinkhole with his um, downspout extender laying in there. You can see their attempt at fixing it. And it's this flowable fill, it's basically concrete. And they pulled in with a concrete truck and just put the hose down there and emptied the truck. And then they came back with the second one. So two entire truckloads of concrete went down that hole. Here's another example, and I want you to note that gray streak back here. I'm pretty sure what happened is they had a sinkhole. They came in with their, um, their truck of concrete, and they poured it down the hole until it filled up. They patched the edge of the road and called it done. But it's back. And as you can see, it's a really big cavity. And you wouldn't want to be pouring just truckload and truckload of concrete down there. You need to get to the root of the problem. And in our karst setting and in our mine subsidence, um, what you really need to do is to get down to the bedrock to find, in the case of a sinkhole, find the throat. 
um, water is still going to need a pathway or it's going to make its own, which in the case of that concrete, water just picked a new pathway and went right around that concrete they put in there. So this is the recommendation from the Department of Environmental Protection. You get down to the bedrock, you find out how big the throat is, and you block it up with material that's bigger than it. Um, so whether it's boulders or old Jersey barriers or um, those panels along the highway for sound, you can get the scrap ones and throw them down there. You wanna bridge that hole. And then fill it with um, graded material. So go the next size down. Maybe it's cobbles. The next size down. Put a layer of gravel, layer of sand. That way the water has a way to go. Then they lay down a geotextile, which is just um, like a spun fabric. And its job is to hold the soil up so it doesn't try to go down into the sand and gravel. And then, you know, monitor it for changes as it's gone through time. So we've got you know, a couple different potential ways to, to cause a hole and a headache um, on your property here in Pennsylvania. And it's important to figure out which problem, you know, what the root of your problem is so you know what the fix is gonna be. And we're here to help. Um, if you have questions, you are welcome to call me or email me. Um, if you have a site specific you know, situation, um, I can help you address it there. And hopefully you won't ever run into a sinkhole or a subsidence feature of any kind. Um, if you do, we can tackle it together. All right. Great program. I see one question in the chat that says, uh, with your uh, repair work, it sounds very expensive. Who pays for that? Ah, uh, well, um, so in Pennsylvania, you can buy sinkhole insurance. It is not very expensive and it doesn't cover much of anything. Um, they won't pay for any preventative measures. So if it opens up in your side yard and starts munching its way towards your garage, they're not gonna pay for it. You're gonna wanna stop it before it gets to your garage. They'll only pay for structural, for the damage that it does to your infrastructure. Um, so in, in the case of like a worst case scenario where you lose you know, your house foundation breaks and you lose half your house or something, then you will get some money, but you won't get any money to fix it as it's headed towards you. You see the problem. Um, so it, it is up to you to fix it. Um, I do have a friend who works excavating in um, Newville on um, Route 81, and he said it would be about $1,500 to $3,000 one day's work, and, and they do that uh, graded system. So he said maybe, because I was asking about a, a friend in Hershey, and they said maybe double it for um, a more expensive region like Hershey. So it is expensive. Um, just, you know, that's why the farmers just let it be. Um, and, and if it's in your yard, you can make that decision. You can say, well, it's, it's far enough away from my structure. I'm not going to worry about it. You know, put up your magic snow fence to keep things out. I'd recommend a bit more durable fencing um, and let it kind of go natural or address it. And I'm not sure what two loads of um, concrete cost, but uh, that fix was, was wasted money down that hole. All right. Our friend Dwayne Herbert, Herbert said, very nice presentation. Went deeper than I thought. I believe there's a little bit of humor in there as what he was intending. Right, yep. Wayne? <laughs> Anybody have any? Uh, Dr. Pomeroy wants to know, could you share the, that website to an access geology bedrock map? The geo. Uh, yes. 
Give me a second and I can put it in the chat, I think. That's a very, that's a very new uh, updated application they have there, I, I believe. So while you're doing that, I saw a show in sinkholes on the Weather Channel where like a lake disappeared down into the ground or the whole surrounding area disappeared. That doesn't happen in Pennsylvania, I guess. Um, it could. The one I know um, by Tallahassee, there's a whole area with a lot of sinkholes and then like the clay layer holds the lake and periodically the lake punches through the clay layer. Um, in that example that I showed on the topo map, you know, it only filled up with water during Hurricane Agnes, which we like to think of as a, a once in a lifetime event, but um, we're getting worse and worse storms. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that again in our lifetimes. Um, and that did drain slowly, but if it had punched open one of the sinkholes, it could have drained quickly. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, Pennsylvania water bodies that are, you know, tend to do that. Um, I did see one labeled sinkhole swamp in Susquehanna County, but that was because they built a railroad bridge and then one day they went out in the railroad or a, a railroad uh, causeway. It all fell into the swamp and I think they just not built a good foundation on that one. Somebody wants to know if they have a sinkhole, or if they know where sinkholes are, how can they report them? Uh, well, they can give me a call or send me an email. And I'd be happy to come look at them and take some pictures and add them to our database. Somebody mentioned the uh, famous Corvette display room in Bowling Green, Kentucky, it fell in. Is, uh, Swallowed a couple of the old, old uh, Corvette cars. I remember that. I remember a case in Florida in the Tampa Bay area where a sinkhole opened up during the night under a house and it basically swallowed the house and the uh, occupant. And they never, they never did recover the, his body. Any other questions? Uh, See, Dennis uh, messaged me directly and asked if the state is still updating and publishing new sinkhole maps. Um, and that is something I am going to be doing. Um, identifying them based on LIDAR, which will help us see the ones that are in the forested areas too. So there will be updates. I don't know if they'll actually be published maps, but they will get served out on that PA Geode website. Mm -hmm. Liz has a question, is compaction and grouting a viable long-term solution to sinkholes? Uh, well, one of the concerns with that is, um, have you found the, the root of the problem? You know, because a lot of times we'll end up with, with a, a path, one pathway down to the fracture. And you fill that in, you solve that problem, um, but you may push it you know, over onto your neighbors, or we see this sometimes along highways, they fix one and it pushes it down the highway and then it's the next, you know, 50 feet down the road or 30 feet down the road. And, and so you could keep filling them in, but remember the water's gonna want some way to go. And until you have either completely plugged up the, the pathway of the water, you know, basically if there's a cave under there, filled it up with, with grout, um, it's, it's not going to solve the problem by itself. Okay. Can you I, uh, Jerry? Yep. Um, I know of a case of um, uh, water disappearing uh, from a sinkhole. Uh, down in Chambersburg, Wilson College had a pool inside of a building. Uh, building was dated around the 30s, I think. Um, and there was some minor leakage in the pool for years. Nothing big. <laughs> Sorry, just a minute. I got you.
Be muted and hang on a second. Un unmute yourself again. Muted. There you go. Okay. One one night the the pool just emptied out, and uh, they discovered a huge sinkhole there huh. uh, underneath. Um, but uh, and we had to get structural engineers in there, and um, actually. Um, they filled it pretty much the way it was described as a, a solution, but then they bridged uh, the um, car structure with, um, with, with a concrete structure, a reinforced concrete structure. And to my knowledge, uh, never leaked again and um, was okay after that. But it, it was a very expensive uh, deal to, to make that fix. And that was, you know, under inside of building. So, yeah, you're right. And, and they have used that bridging technique, uh, like in Palmyra near the sinkhole saloon. Um, yeah. Actually the subsurface is a whole lot of Swiss cheese. And unless they want to just dig up the entire neighborhood, uh, they're not going to be able to fix it. So for, um, I think it's 422, they, they engineered essentially a floating bridge that sits on the soil. So a bunch of the soil can leave and, and then it can, you know, it'll continue to hold the weight of all the vehicles. So but that gets pretty expensive. Yeah. Um, somebody mentioned the bus in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and that one was a sort of man-made thing. There was, um, I don't know if it was broken water lines or whatnot, but it had carved out under the road and fell into the void. So no limestone in Pittsburgh. Um, of course, they do have to watch out for mine subsidence with all the coal mining out there. Um, and luckily, nobody got hurt on that bus. So and then Larry asks about the geologic age of the limestone, if that has any um, bearing on its susceptibility. Um, and it does not. Um, we're finding more like if there's impurities in the limestone, that helps. If it's well fractured, that helps um, and possibly if it was a reef deposit which is a real limited uh, setting but but the limestone reefs create irregularities that really encourage the dissolution how about how about the uh, housing development uh, housing projects under construction what steps are taken to ensure the land is safe <laughs> That depends on your builder. Um, because a lot of times they don't, um, you know, they're not gonna spend time searching through the historic records necessarily. Um, but you do have in the real estate law, a seller's disclosure statement that if they know about a sinkhole, they have to let you know. So if they never occupied it, like if it's an estate sale and the kids are selling it, they maybe don't know what happened there. But um, in the case I'm working with right now in Palmyra, the builder literally refilled the sinkhole three times before they sold the house. And luckily it's back in the swale, it's not at her house, but it keeps opening up and uh, they, they brought out a wheelbarrow full of sacrete and threw it down there and that lasted for three months. Um, so hopefully they can get that fixed for her. So I would encourage, you know, since the builders aren't necessarily looking out for us, that if you guys are looking at a property to look into those things. Yep. Um, uh, Liz wants to know, is there a viable surface or subsurface scanning technology to pick up Pinnacle, uh, limestone, or sinkholes? Um, would be a better question for geophysicists, but I know um, so ground penetrating radar doesn't go very deep. Um, we're talking on the order like 10 feet, depending on the density of the material. That would pick up the density contracts between soil and limestone. Um, another thing you could try is resistivity because the soil, the clay is going to be wet and the limestone is going to be dry. 
Um, trying to think what else would would help you see that contrast. Actually, it's mostly the surface uh, features that you want you want to look for to tell you what's happening subsurface wise. All right, that's all the questions I believe. Uh, Rosanna put her contact information there. Uh, if you ever have want to report sinkholes or uh, have more questions to her directly. And that phone number is the main line to the building. So you can just tell her that you want to talk to me or that you have a sinkhole and that'll get also to me. You know, Randy. Brittany, do you have any sinkhole stories? Unfortunately, I actually do not. I was thinking and no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> but that was really great, Rosie. Thank you. And what a cool thing to get to do at your job every day. <laughs> yeah. It gives, it gives her a, a sinking feeling. <laughs> hey, y'all know that uh, snails have a reputation of being slow and they always lose the race against any other type of animal, but this one snail was pretty smart where he went out and bought a sports car. And the snail put on the side of the car on both sides a big S, the letter S. When he went zooming down the road, people would say, hey, look at that S cargo. Think about that until next week, and we'll. <laughs> Good one, Jerry. <laughs> Before I pass it over to Brittany to say goodbye to everybody, uh, thank you, Kim, for joining us tonight. Uh, we expect to see more fossils coming coming uh, through the Zoom that you uh, get down there on on your beach. And uh, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Pomeroy, uh, thanks for having at least one of your students in here tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at our appointments in November that we, we set up. And uh, great to see everybody back tonight. We had uh, 46 people in the room tonight. So uh, obviously, uh, sinkholes is a pretty attractive uh, subject. Uh, so, uh, so thanks for that. New people, reminders, uh, the video for tonight's program will be put on uh, jonesgeo.com tomorrow morning. And uh, it will be there for the next few weeks until we take it down. Although I've, I think I've look, I've been able to locate where the, all the YouTube videos are. So if you're, if you're missing one, and I know there's a couple of you who have uh, been wanting to see a certain one. I think I have finally found how you can find them on YouTube, at least through my account. And I will send you uh, links, or I'll put the link out there to uh, one in particular. I know that you're somebody's looking for. Uh, and also, I want to thank, uh, we had in, 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 in this uh, hiatus a little bit, we had several letters uh, from people, emails actually, uh, thanking us to ha having Zoom Rock Room and how much they appreciate it and how much they have, uh, I've learned from it. So it kind of makes us uh, feel good. Um, I do want to put a survey question out there and you can start thinking about it, is that, uh, Starting in September, uh, would you want to go every other Tuesday or like the second and fourth Tuesday instead of every week? Since we're kind of getting out of, hopefully getting out of this uh, COVID thing, uh, although we may be turning an, an, another route with the with the new uh, new virus coming around, the new uh, strain. But uh, anyway, just keep about the, uh, keep, keep in mind we. We've been thinking about going to every other week or something like that instead of every week. So anyway, turn it over to Brittany. Uh, say something, you know, say good night there, Brittany, to everybody else. Yep. Again, that was a great presentation. And uh, yeah, um, Jerry forwards me the emails that you guys send and I appreciate reading them too. So thank you. And thanks for letting me in, even though I said I wasn't going to be here today. No pain. Um, no pay. No pay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye, everyone.
We'll see you, everybody. Thanks, Rosanna. <laughs>